In this PowerPoint, we'll review more information found in chemical equations. In particular, we'll examine how information about the state of reactants and products can be conveyed, as well as the differences between molecular and ionic equations. Let's begin with state. In many chemical equations, you'll find the phase or state of the reactants and products noted in parentheses following the formula. An S in parentheses stands for solid. L is for liquid. And G is for gas. A very common state designation is actually AQ. This stands for aqueous solution, and it means that the compound has to be dissolved in water for this reaction to occur. There are a wide variety of reactions that take place in water, and there are two common ways of writing chemical equations for aqueous reactions, depending on the types of substances involved. One of the most common ways is called the molecular equation, and this is the type that we've been using up till now, where we show the full formula of all reactants and products. In an ionic equation, in contrast, we show the separated ions from electrolyte reactants and products that are dissolved in water. So those that have the AQ following it. Now electrolytes are ionic compounds and acids. So in this example, sodium bicarbonate, sulfuric acid, and sodium sulfate. When these substances dissolve in water, they actually separate into positive and negative ions that are surrounded by water molecules and can move freely and independently of each other. And we show these individual ions in the ionic equation. So sodium bicarbonate breaks apart into sodium and bicarbonate, sulfuric acid into hydrogen and sulfate ions, and sodium sulfate into sodium and sulfate ions. The remaining two products in this particular reaction are water and carbon dioxide. So these are molecular substances that do not break apart into ions. They're pure liquids and pure gases in this case, and so we keep them in that molecular formula in our final ionic equation. The ionic equation only shows the ions that are formed during that dissolving process. There's another variation on the ionic equation. It's known as the net ionic equation. And it actually only shows the ions that combine to form products that are solids, liquids, and gases. So in the full ionic equation written here, there are actually a few ions that are present in the same form on both sides of the arrow. For example, sodium. We have two sodium ions on the left. We have two sodium ions on the right. We also have one sulfate ion on the left and one sulfate ion on the right. So because they are present in the exact same form on both sides of the arrow, it indicates that they never really came together to form a new compound. They remain dissociated ions throughout. We say that these are spectator ions. They really didn't take part in the heart of the reaction, which formed a new substance. And in a net ionic equation, we actually eliminate those spectator ions, and we focus only on those ions that actually formed a new substance, a pure solid liquid or gas. So in this case, what's left is our bicarbonate, our hydrogen on the left-hand side of the arrow, and they formed the two molecular substances, water and carbon dioxide, on the right-hand side. This is the heart of this particular reaction. Electrolytes are substances that dissociate into ions in water. There are two major classes of compounds that do this, ionic compounds when they dissolve, and acids. So ionic compounds uh, the, are made up of positively and negatively charged ions. They're found in a crystal lattice in the solid form. When they're put into water, 
water molecules are actually attracted to those ions and the tiny water molecules can work their way and surround individual ions and separate them from each other. And this is how we end up with dissociated free floating ions in solution, both positive and negative. Acids, on the other hand, when they dissolve in water, they actually react with the water to lose a hydrogen ion. And we'll look at this a little bit more closely in a later PowerPoint. So electrolytes are substances that can conduct electricity when dissolved in water. That's where the name comes from, electrolyte. So this middle beaker is what's called a strong electrolyte. It contains the ionic compound potassium chloride dissolved in water. And it's the dissociated ions of potassium and negatively charged chloride that are actually able to carry the current through water because they are able to move freely and independently of each other. Now a strong electrolyte includes soluble ionic compounds, those that dissolve readily in water and produce a lot of ions, as well as strong acids, which dissociate completely in water to produce hydrogen and anions. The beaker on the right is an example of what we call a weak electrolyte. So it's weak because it produces less ions in solution. So these are generally weak acids. Weak acids do dissociate to a degree, but it's only a fraction of the amount that a strong acid would dissociate and produce hydrogen in an anion. And since there are less ions produced in solution, they don't carry current as well. We also have what are called non-electrolytes. These are substances that don't conduct electricity in water. And these are molecular substances that don't dissociate at all. So we have no free floating charge to actually carry a current. When electrolytes react in solution, it's really the dissociated ions that interact with each other and form new compounds. We're going to look at an example of two ionic compounds reacting with each other, sodium chloride and silver nitrate. In order for these two substances to interact, they do have to be dissolved in water. That's indicated by the AQ that actually follows them. They're soluble compounds. That means that they dissociate into uh, ions, free-floating ions in solution. Now, when we mix these two beakers together, all of those different ions can actually approach each other. And if any two ions approach each other and form a new compound that's not soluble in water, for example, solid silver chloride, then those ions will actually remove themselves from solution. So anytime a silver ion and a chloride ion come together, they form a solid. And that solid comes out of the water solution, it precipitates out and goes to the bottom. And as that those two reactant solutions mix over time, more and more silver will approach more and more chloride ion and solids will continue to form and the silver and chloride will continue to come out of solution. And eventually you can get to a point where all of the silver chloride has actually come out of solution. None of it is left in the water. And the only thing that are left are the sodium and the nitrate ions. And it turns out that the sodium and nitrate are also approaching each other. And when they do so, they actually form a new ionic compound as well, sodium nitrate. But sodium nitrate is soluble in water. And that means that the sodium and nitrate remain as dissociated ions. They don't come out of solution. What this looks like is that they actually haven't changed form from the reactant phase to the product phase. These are our spectator ions. So we can represent all of this in ionic equations. This is a visual representation with our beakers here of the ionic equations, but you can also write out a complete ionic equation, which shows our dissociated ions formed from each of these ionic compounds coming part dissociating. And we can eliminate our spectator ions, the ones that stay 
uh, dissociated in ionic form throughout the course of the reaction. So that's the sodium and the nitrate. And that can be rewritten as our net ionic equation, which shows us the heart of this reaction really is silver and chloride ions coming together to form an insoluble product, silver chloride. So let's look at an example of writing a complete ionic and net ionic equation for a given molecular equation. And the one that we're going to look at is the reaction between sodium chloride and water to produce sodium hydroxide and hydrogen and chlorine gas. So the first step in writing an ionic equation is actually to look for the electrolyte substances that are going to have to be written as dissociated ions. So in this particular equation, I see two. I see the ionic compound sodium chloride and the ionic compound sodium hydroxide. I look for ionic compounds and acids followed by AQ. When I see those, I know that they're going to be written in dissociated ion form. The remaining reactants and products are molecules. They're liquids and gases, and they're molecular compounds that don't dissociate into ions. So I'm going to carry over that molecular formula as is into my ionic compound. I don't have to break this apart into different ions. So I start with my first ionic compound, the sodium chloride. And to break that apart into ions, you just have to remember what you know about ions and typical charges and charge balance. So, for example, I know that sodium is a metal in column one of the periodic table, and all column one metals form ions with a plus one charge. I also know that chloride is a nonmetal in column 17. All the nonmetals in that column form negative one charged ions. So that means when I break this compound apart, I have sodiums with a plus one and chlorides with a negative one. I have two of each ion simply reflecting the coefficient from the balanced chemical equation. My next uh, reactant is liquid water. Molecular substance, so I write the molecular formula. Then we move on to the product side, on the other side of the arrow, and we have sodium hydroxide, which is an aqueous ionic substance. So we separate this into ions. And again, I use what I know about charges and charge balance. Sodium ions are still plus one, Hydroxide ions, the remaining part of that formula, has to be a polyatomic. So you can look this up and discover it's a hydroxide ion, OH group, um, and that the charge on that is generally a negative one. You can also figure out the charge from just a general charge balance with the compound. If the compound has uh, a sodium ion, one sodium ion, with a plus one charge and one hydroxide ion, the hydroxide must have a negative one charge to balance out. So we actually put the two for each of these because there's a two coefficient in the balanced chemical equation. So two sodium balanced with two hydroxides. And then we carry over our remaining products, which are gases, as their molecular formulas, H2 and Cl2. To write the net ionic equation, we just have to eliminate the spectator ions. So we look on either side of that arrow for ions that are exactly the same, present on both sides. And there's only one, the sodium ion. So we eliminate our sodium ions from each side to write our net ionic equation. Two chloride ion react with two water to produce two hydroxide ions plus hydrogen and chlorine gas. And we know that from that we have a spectator ion of sodium. In summary, chemical equations can also provide information on the state of the reactants and products. For example, whether the substances are solids, liquids, gases, or aqueous solutions, meaning dissolved in water. When electrolytes, which are aqueous ionic compounds and acids, when these substances react, it's the dissociated ions in solution that actually form new compounds. And a complete ionic equation shows all the dissolved ions in a reaction between electrolytes.
A net ionic equation shows only the ions that chemically react. It does not include spectator ions.